Welcome today, welcome. and um, we're we are in person. Um, it'll take maybe a while to get the message out to everybody, but to the extent that you feel comfortable being here, um, you're more than welcome to come. The coffee's warm, and the conversation is is warm as well. So I don't know. Does that even make sense? I don't know. But uh, we we uh, we'll start today with the with the prayer of the day. Almighty Creator and ever-living God, we worship your glory, eternal three in one, and we praise your power, majestic one in three. Keep us steadfast in this faith, defend us in all adversity, and bring us at last into your presence, where you live in endless joy and love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, our first reading is from Isaiah 6. How, does, how do you say the word, the S-E-R-A-P-H-S? Seraphs? Seraphs, yeah. Oh, there's a person. Hey, Isaiah. So this is for, hey, Rod, this is the uh, first Isaiah. Isaiah 6, 1 through In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces, and with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called and the house filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Not gonna be in that train. So the seraph is a, uh, a very large bird, isn't it? Flying, like a flying something. Yeah. Six wings. It's a flying husker. A unique uh, uh, so. with multiple sets of wings. Yes. And I forget yeah. what the seraphim and It's the seraphim and the, the cherubim. Mm -hmm. Seraphs, winged cobras, often represented in Egyptian art and associated with the Syrophoenician thrones and on Israelite seals with wings outstretched to protect the deity. Here they must protect themselves from the glory of God. Winged cobra. That, there's nothing scarier than a snake that flies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, God made snakes, but if he wanted to really make them really terrifying, put wings on them. Well, I think... I think the uh, given that it's Holy Trinity Sunday, the the last the last verse here. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, "Whom shall I send, and who will go for us?" And I said, "Here am I. Send me." And we Here in the is that song. Here I am, Lord. Mm -hmm. The house filled with smoke. Mm -hmm. 
Well, and then the, the grace is, you know, I am lost for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I mean, that's a message of grace. And I, I, know, I forgot that this text, you know, the text of the calling of, of Isaiah uh, as a prophet, uh, that it comes on Trinity Sunday is interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking too. Yeah. And so why is that the case? Yeah. Um, Right. Other than that, you know, that we are called into, um, you know, here, I mean, the focus is on, uh, you know, who is, who is the Lord sending, you know, who, you know, and, and, uh, and I think, the problem is Trinity with Trinity Sunday, we have made it we've made it so much about doctrine, you know, a doctrinal statement that it's you know that you know, that we have to believe in the triune God and and all of that we forget the action involved. Um, you know, that that we are called um, and, and God sends us um, where God will, God wills. And uh, well, there's the, the triune God and then there's us as right. the, the recipients of the word and the respondents of the, of the call. Well, and I think, you know, that's the struggle with, you know, when we try to make the Trinity into a doctrine that somehow we can understand we don't have the awe and the wonder of Isaiah that says that there's no way. There's just, you know, and, and we may encounter, we may encounter this triumph of God, but we can't understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know well, what else all that. What else do you folks hear from Isaiah here? I think it's the, we talked about last week, the tongues of fire that appeared on the disciples' head in Acts where the Holy Spirit whooshes through. There's, you know, the seraph, mm -hmm. <laughs> creepy angel thing, uh, touches his lips with a hot coal as um, sort of like, um, purifying, like, right, touches his lips and then says, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. So it's like God is in this heat, in this fire um, with forgiveness and grace. Yeah, they, they use fire throughout the Bible as a purifying mm -hmm. thing, like, you know, the bad people and non-believers going to be thrown in the fire and purified and mm -hmm. they, uh, they purify the earth i guess and mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the tongues of fire the symbols of fire there's always you know flames showing mm -hmm. that uh cleansing i guess mm -hmm. so here the the fire to cleanse your lips for the, the hot coal anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the the call, this beginning of the call of the prophet Isaiah, the call mm -hmm. of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Although when I when I hear Isaiah, I've been so trained to think of Isaiah as a group of like a school of thought and not just one person. But It began somewhere. Person. Yeah, it began. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's just talking about the beginning of of, the, of that whole school movement. Of, yeah, prophetic movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess that'd be a better way of instead of thinking of it as a school, but of thinking of it as a 
prophetic movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is moved moved by the thought. Of the, and and I think you know what you're saying right, about we lose sight of we tend to see the destruction that fire can cause and we hear more much more about that and don't um, realize you know that it also has a very purifying effect um, that's you know one of the things my brother who's a brain scientist and, and retired from UNL but he you know he talks about how especially in the eastern half of the sand hills the the red cedar the juniper cedar trees have just taken over yeah they're weeds many and he he regards them as weeds he would just he would just destroy them and and part of the reason they they have taken over the way they have is that there used to be fires Mm-hmm. That, that occasionally just, mm-hmm. a roar, but, roar, yeah that would be that would just clean up, up. Just clean up and, yeah. and burn up all the cedars on the up, yeah, on right. the plains the only cedars that escaped were ones that were down next to the water or down in, in a valley somewhere otherwise um, so it was a and, and my brother's he said it's a, it was a purifying of the plains because <laughs> it got, it got rid of all the, <laughs> uh, I won't I won't use all the language he uses to describe <laughs> 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 he, he is not their friend uh, let mm-hmm. us say that well then uh, you know the forest fires that they have in Colorado and the mountains you know, it takes the heat of the fire to pop open the pine cones to uh, mm-hmm. get new growth. Mm. So it's I think it's also like this is not a pleasant call story. I, you know, it's probably terrifying. It was a vision, I guess, but that call stories aren't always like pretty wrapped in a nice little bow you feel so fulfilled. It's like, it's a scary world. And that's a good point, Greta. I mean, if God came to us in a, as a little mouse, you know, mm-hmm. you know, we wouldn't take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a good point. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it takes a big event to wake us up, right? Well, Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, you gods. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due God's name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The Lord makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Mount Hermon uh, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord bursts forth in lightning flashes. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oak trees writhe and strips the forest bare. And in the temple of the Lord, all are crying glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forevermore. O Lord, give strength to your people. Give them, O Lord, the blessings of peace. There you go. A voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. Mm -hmm. You can tell your brother that we just need the voice of the Lord over the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it, it, like, it sounds like fire, like with the la- lightning and thunder, but then like makes the oak trees rise and strips the forest bare, right? It sounds like a forest fire. Yeah, well, I think that's kind of a, that was a neat segue into what we, our last point in Isaiah about your comment about the call and how God, you know, this is a, this is a God who means business. Yeah. He's not, he's not there to 
It's not, it's not milk. Around. Not milk toast. Yeah. He's a mm -hmm. god of. He's a god of action. Mm -hmm. He's somebody you want on your side. You want him on your team. Hey, that's yeah. right. I think it's inter you were like there's this whole big storm, lightning, thunder, the voice of the Lord shaking things, and then verse eleven. Strength your people and then give them the blessing of peace. So you're like going through the storm, but then through that, you end with peace. Mm -hmm. Which we like to think of as calm, but peace doesn't necessarily mean that it's calm. Right. That's a good point, too. It reminds me of what you say. It reminds me of the storm on the Sea of Galilee and mm -hmm. the terrifying example, the terrifying situation with the disciples, but there's God there at the bow, just resting peacefully. But he's there with them, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. the whole point. I don't know. This is one of those, do we think of God as this big God, or do we think of God as, the, you know, more personal relationship? I mean, you know, I think it just depends on the situation and on the, the, the need that we might have at the time, but I think there's a place for both. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, Pastor Glenn was talking about the, the Trinity. And, you know, when I think of a personal relationship with God, it's with the Holy Spirit, because I just feel that he's there and it's easy to talk to him. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I look up to God, the creator, the all powerful, I mean, the everything. And, you know, Jesus as our savior and all that he did for us. And I'm in awe. And, and that's why the Trinity is so confusing because it's all one. But yet, when you think about the three parts of the Trinity, you can, you can separate them. And, and the Holy Spirit is the same as Jesus, is the same as God, but yet this personal relationship that I have, to me, it seems to be with the Holy Spirit because mm -hmm. uh, he just seems more approachable, I guess. Mm -hmm. or, uh, and I should be just as much in awe of the Holy Spirit as I am of God and Jesus, but uh, to me, it just seems like it's, you know, somebody who's there for me. My best buddy can talk to me, you know, when I talk to him. So, uh, You know, that's a good point. I mean, how do we view, what is our, what is our view of God? How do we access God? How do we access that relationship? What does it look like? I mean, for you, it's the Holy Spirit. I mean, I mean, for others, it might be, it might be different. Yeah. I mean, I, sometimes I don't. Sometimes, quite frankly, I don't know, you know, who I'm talking to. Right. I mean, <laughs> God, you know, whichever one he Which wants is. to listen. <laughs> just, you know. yeah. I mean, how often do we say, you know, in our prayer life, dear Holy Spirit? Yeah. No. You know, yeah. but it's a valid way of, of speaking to God, I'm sure. I think the you know and the danger of the Trinity is that we can compartmentalize God. Yeah, for sure. You know, and that you know what you know your meditation yesterday morning, your devotion yesterday morning, when you talked about you know that we're that we're called to wholeness to to embrace our whole self. Mm -hmm. And that we are also called to embrace the whole God, the God who um, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. Right. The God who, and the God, I guess the way I prefer to see it now is the God who, um, you know, well, someone said to me the other day that, you know, there is one thing that God lacks, uh, and that's limitation. Hmm. Hmm. And 
that, but we have a God who is willing to come and share and, and limit God's self, is willing to take on limitation, the limitation of being human, the limitation, you know, to help us understand what does it mean to be whole? What does it mean to be a whole person? How do we, how do we understand what that concept of, of wholeness and being a whole person is about? Um, and I think, you know, the, um, and how do we, how do we listen for this God who is, um, who, yeah, I mean, comes to Isaiah in this, uh, in a way that, you know, gets his attention. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't, when I think about that in my life, um, yeah, God has gotten my attention numerous times by, but it hasn't been overwhelming force. It's been by someone really listening to me um, and saying, uh, we care about you and, but uh, you need to, you need to look at what, what is it that God's calling you to do? Um, I mean, I, uh, Keith had, and I think I shared this story of Keith who was uh, in, when I was serving Emmanuel in Council Bluffs, he was on our, on my interim staff's uh, interim steering committee. And uh, Keith would sit, you know, right there. <laughs> and he would take notes of every sermon. I preached. <laughs> and one day he after church he comes to me and he says, Pastor, can uh, I have something to talk to you about? Can I come in this weekend? So he came in and he said, um, I've been going, I've been looking back at what at your sermons, and he said, uh, and this was at a time um right after, uh, close after my mother died and both. And so, and so he said, um, you know, we appreciate your grief and understand your grief, but do you realize that you have talked about your parents and your grief in the last six sermons you have given? And, you know, while we are here for you, and support to you. I'm not sure that is what we need to be hearing on Sunday morning. Hmm. You need to hear that. We don't want to hear it six times. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, you know, it, it, what he was saying is true. It, it was getting in my way. It truly was getting in my way. <clears throat> it wasn't so much about what he wanted to hear mm -hmm. as it was getting in my way of proclaiming, you know, God's word because I was more focused on my grief, uh, and dealing with my grief than I was on, you know, proclaiming God's word. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, but, you know, that's where I think, um, yeah, we, we can look for God in these, you know, these monumental events. But my experience in my life is that God has a way of coming to us in, in the midst of um, those uh, with people who are willing to just take a risk. <laughs> I mean, it was a big risk for Keith. I mean, you know, he didn't know me. I mean, we knew each other fairly well because he'd been on the steering committee for, and, and I'd gotten to know him. And so, but he was willing to, to take that risk and say, you know, we need to, you need to think about this. And I think, wow, <laughs> it's always had, it's always had a real impact um, on me. And I, I just have any number of stories mm -hmm. throughout my life that where that has happened. And uh, so it can come to us in, in these kind of big events, <laughs> you know, 
stripping the forest there, but uh, it also you know, we're having having an angel touch your lips with a hot coal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I don't know if you you know. Well, there aren't very very many events like that that happen in our life, but yeah, I think if we if we look around we'll see that we're touched by God in many ways, you know, throughout our life, sometimes throughout our day. And you know, the people he sends into our life, the sunshine that he gives, I mean, it's just, if you take enough time to, to think about God, instead of your hectic everyday life going here and going there, it's, it's amazing how you will see God and the gifts that he gives you. So. And, I, and I guess the other thing I do with that is uh, taking time to really look at, at the heart of God rather than the power of God. Many times we get focused on the power of God rather than you know God's heart and God's love. Sad about. Any final thoughts on Psalm? On the Psalm? Just, we heard about a, a very powerful God in the first two. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we have. I think that theme will carry through. But... So, <clears throat> well, Romans 8. Um, Brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. That one is a tough, especially that last line, you know, that we are, that we are called to suffer with Christ. This is, you know, Paul's whole argument, this part of Romans is about the distinction between law and gospel. To live, to live in the flesh is to be belong to the law, but to live in the spirit is a totally different matter. And so I think he's making a distinction about you know what it means to what it means to be faithful is to live according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. And it, the I really like the book of Romans mm -hmm. and it's, it's very tender. It's, it really is a good guide to, you know, how to live our life and how to, you know, there's a big comparison about living by the law and living by uh, faith. But the, the sense I get out of it and I get out of many of Paul's writings are well you haven't suffered like i have oh. and until you've yeah. suffered like i have you can't really you know be saved and, and be called it and you know I, I think it might cause people to go out and try to suffer just to you know and, and it you know, you can't work your way into heaven by 
suffering for God, but you need to give your life away in some ways. And you need to do what you think God calls you. So um, it, I don't like the word suffering. I don't, I don't think God wants us to suffer at all. I think God wants us to live for him. And I think that's why he sent us the Holy Spirit to help keep us from, from suffering or to lead us in a way that we would go, that we would suffer a, a whole lot less. So I just, I just don't like the connotation of suffering in this. Passage. Yeah, I no, I hear you. Um, I was trying to refresh my memory with the, the Greek concept of suffering and what that might have meant because sometimes the translation into Western thought and English is maybe different than what Paul had originally intended yeah, yeah. the word to be. And so um, to, to suffer maybe with, in, in Paul's context is, is more of to bear with or to endure. I mean, you know, the, there's the Buddhists have, have a real strong concept of, of suffering and it's not so much about, about pain as much as it is about living in the reality of, mm -hmm. of the world. And so I wonder if, because I think you make a really good point because I think a lot of us read this and we are like, how could we ever be like Paul? I mean, he's such a, I mean, what's the word when you wish pain upon yourself, you know? I mean, sorry. You know, and, uh, See, I always relate the word suffer to when I was, a, I was a graduate student at UNL in fine arts. I mean, this was after I'd had my, my bachelor's degree and was teaching and working and whatnot. And Peter Hill, did anybody remember Peter Hill was the uh, art teacher at UNL and he was what was called a hard edge painter. Everything was, he taped um, shapes and whatnot and mm. they were done with acrylic paint and you know, they were very exact. Yeah. And um, so I was in his class and one day he came by my, and I was working on a painting and he came by and he said, you know, I really don't think you've suffered enough to be a really good painter. Oh. And I didn't take his class anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I finished that class and said, okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So adding, I'm not sure exactly what. <laughs> adding a little psychology to your art style. Yeah. yeah. Or something. Right. That was his style. It's his style, but, but it wasn't mine. Right. You know, but well, he thought art. it he thought it should be, or else I should turn it into something that was mine. Well, I don't you know. want me to do chew my arm off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I re recently watched a movie um called American Animals. I don't know. It was big a few years ago because I've like won a film contest or something, but it's about these college students that one yeah. of them's a writer and he decides that the best writers, well, I, no, he's a painter. The best artists that have the most like prolific works went through some major trial in their life, right? right? And so they yeah. end up like robbing a library and get caught because they're trying to like do something exciting and powerful and life changing. And then it's like, so it's all, it's just exploring this concept of like, what does it mean to like try to find that and like force it upon yourself mm -hmm. rather than just like living your actual truth and your, right. where life is leading you. Yeah. I guess they could have just cut off their ear. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Like, like Dan Go did, yeah. 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 Hmm. Well, but, yeah. but there is something to that. I mean, I've just recently listened to this. Uh, I found an, some old vinyl that I had of uh, that it was it's a little set called Meet the Classics. And it talks about Beethoven, Bach, 
once our control panel. And all four of them talks about how their music grew out of their suffering. And that, uh, I mean, one of the most obvious one is, is Beethoven, who was totally deaf by the time he was 40 and yet wrote his greatest classics were all written after he went totally deaf. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he, after suffering the loss of hearing, which isn't something he chose, he did not choose. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, the difference. We don't choose, except the, the suffering we may choose is, the, and what you have said, that the idea of suffering that Paul's talking about too is being willing to walk with walk with persons who are suffering. You know, what does that mm -hmm. what does that mean? I you know, um, and 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 I feel very strongly about that because you know that's been really the basis of my whole ministry mm -hmm. is you know walking with you know, what well when I was working in addiction, walking with helping other young people, sure, you know, and walking with families, walking with, you know, and uh, where when I got into intentional interim ministry, of uh, uh, you know, walking with congregations and with people who were, uh, you know, suffering greatly, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, great anger, <laughs> you know, great, great hurt, and being able to say to them, you know, this isn't, um, this wasn't of your choosing. <laughs> you didn't choose this, but it's what's happened. It's the reality. It's the reality of the world that we live in. Well, I think that each one of us need to be prepared you know, to stand up and uh, proclaim our faith. You know, we're not, you know, and to support missionaries who go out and, you know, really do suffer and, you know, to proclaim the, their faith and, you know, help people who are in different places in the world who are suffering and dying for their faith. And you know, look back on the, you know, the history of this country. It was founded so that people could have freedom, you know, of their of their faith. So, yeah, I would think I do get under the sentiment earlier of like it almost seems like Paul is encouraging people to go out and suffer and saying that you can't believe until you suffer that the sort of idea you can't be an artist until you suffer but I think it's not saying you have to suffer but not to be afraid of suffering mm -hmm. to sort of be bold you, like we're children of God he's adopted us that the spirit of God is not a fear it's a boldness so not necessarily seeking out suffering but not being afraid to suffer and you know be bold do do what god's calling you to do instead of being meek and afraid of suffering because of where that calling is leading you yeah so many times i think in our society today the suffering that we may endure is being ostracized because we stand up for what we believe in our faith or acknowledge that we have a faith in God and that you know, standing up against other people in society who are you know trying to not have God in their lives or in our schools or in our office buildings or just the so many times that's the fear of suffering, I think, keeps a lot of people from, from acting. But I think what you're saying is the type of suffering that you might be acknowledging, you might be talking about. Well, 
preach on John 3. <clears throat> now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not, do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet we do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has assisted into heaven ascended into heaven, except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. <clears throat> For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Verse 16 is familiar to everyone, so Luke and all of them, the many gospels, the many gospels. Just that one verse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it speaks of the, the promise. Mm -hmm. 17 is pretty good too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know, that uh, 16 is a very powerful verse, but 17, I think, is almost as powerful in that it really gives us hope. You know. He didn't come down here to say, you're bad, you're bad, and you can't do anything about it. You're bad. No, you can be good. You can be saved. You are saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it's just, trust me, many times in my life, I needed that hot coal of, to burn my lips for things that I said. Well, that's what it means to be reborn. I mean, and just to have, to have that whole concept about being reborn is not necessarily just about being reborn, but understanding it. For Nicodemus, this is about uh, a revelation, a personal revelation for him of understanding what that, what that means. Yeah. You know, and to have, to and be, through that understanding, to live in the hope, you know, and to live daily knowing that God loves you and that that's gonna you know with Nicodemus that obviously he was a pharisaic Jew mm -hmm. who is afraid to approach Jesus in the daylight for for being seen by his yeah, just as I was saying before standing up acknowledging suffering yeah because his other buddies would see him and uh, <clears throat> think less of how could you know what are you doing there yeah. how? but for this it's about this I mean yes it's the message of of the gospel but it's also a message of helping us understand how 
we too are transformed through the reef, through baptism. And uh, you know, I'm I'm of an age that uh, my rebellious youth and life was during the term of the flower children and everybody, you know, going around, oh we're we're born again. And I'm going, what are you talking about? You know, I was Nicodemus trying to understand oh, you, you know, you're crazy, you're nuts, you know, you and uh it, it took me a long time and you know coming back to God. Luckily he kept me safe and uh, you know until I saw the light, I guess. But it's a it's a hard concept, you know, to but yet again when you think of it, it's such an easy concept. You know, give up the life you have now and change and you know, accept God and and, and you're reborn. You're a new person. Yeah. But that's not very easy. No, oh, it's not easy to do. It's it's no. it's, it's not easy to understand. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a daily that's right. That's right. That's right. Luther said it was, yeah, he had to daily die. I mean, it, he used the term daily die to yourself, daily die to the old Adam. He's be drowned daily. Um, modern 20th century, 21st century language is, is more about the death of the ego, that um, letting our ego die <laughs> on a daily basis. Like it's, uh, that is, like you say, Carol. That is, you know, I, I, how do how do we how do we let our ego go, and so that um, I'm not I'm not worried about what others are going to be thinking of me. <laughs> you know, um, and, and who is up in the tree? What what was the Zach, Zach yes. Ryan? Nikias. That's it. I was getting man. And yeah. Yes. <laughs> With a those big, guys, big ego. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a wee little man. <laughs> yeah. Those guys with those big names. The jar with big monster trucks. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, uh, either a monster truck or, you know, and help a roommate. Oh. <laughs> or Ferrari, even. Yeah. I'm going with Monster Truck. <laughs> Do with, with, a, with a dual tires on the back and the. No, you, you don't need it. And you need it. You need it jacked up. You know, so Have you been looking at my garage? <laughs> two, two feet off the ground. Yeah, I live in Kansas. I think. <laughs> But you know, we started today with fear, 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 and end with love. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. That's what I always like to say. The last God's last word is the word of grace. Mm -hmm. The final. But even if we look in the person to person, you know, the fear and the, the hot coals, you know, it's that's love too and tenderness. Mm -hmm. I'll touch your lips with this hot coal to get rid of the sin, but I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, get Isaiah get food so that he can preach the word of God or help us understand this book so that we can better pass on the word of God. The other thing I would just point out with John is how he he has these um, these dual concepts that kind of go throughout his entire gospel, and one of them is light and darkness, night and day. Um, and Nicodemus, who he starts off by describing how he comes to him by night, but at the end of the gospel. Um, he's mentioned again um, in the daylight. Mm -hmm. And so John wants us to know 
how he has been transformed, that he has been he has been reborn into the light. And I think I think that's a, a concept that needs to be lifted up when we when we think of Nicodemus, we think of someone who has just been totally transformed by the love of God. And and what that means because he's at he's at the burial of Jesus. He shows up. He shows up in uh, chapter 19. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. Um, So, you know, that's, that's where we see him again. And so John doesn't say much more about Nicodemus except to, to just share with, with the audience that uh, he was here at the burial, which, which if you think about it, anybody, any disciple who was associated with Jesus at his death was pretty darn faithful because the rest of them scrammed. Right. And so if if Nicodemus was there, truly was there, then he had been, he had truly been transformed. And uh, I think that's noteworthy when we hear this story in chapter three. So anyway, the power of the spirit is strong. Yeah. Well, Joseph who Gave him his tomb. That's the only time we hear about him in the Bible. Yeah. Which one? Joseph there, there, yeah. Vienna, whatever. Yeah. 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 Oh, he... he was a secret disciple. But he gave him, gave him a lot of money. And then it, uh, you know, Jesus was feeding 5,000 and speaking to 5,000 and going through. I mean, there are many people who heard and saw Jesus during this time here and were accepted and converted. And I'm sure there were many secret Josephs. Mm -hmm. Amongst the most powerful, it wasn't just the common man that was going out to the sea. Mm -hmm. For sure. Any other any other thoughts? Or any thoughts on the Trinity or thoughts on life? I guess <laughs> well, one thought is that and I was Trying, I was reflecting, trying to think of John. John doesn't seem to use fire as the, you know, as a sign of the spirit and then you know, the purifying elements of fire. He is more talking about the, you know, for him, uh, the times I think of that he mentions the spirit, it's, it is, you know, like. When the when the disciples are gathered and it says the wind blows through the the, the, the upper room and, and suddenly Jesus appears. You know, it's it, it's more the idea of the wind and um, and but also the freedom of the wind. You know, wind blows where it will. Uh, you don't. So we, don't, we don't control it. We don't control it. Um, we, can, we can only try to read it. Like, you know, when, when you go golfing and you don't, you want to know <laughs> which way the wind is blowing. So you take, you know, throw a piece of grass, you put your 
people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can only read the wind. You can't. I, the wind is a really interesting thing. I mean, the wind will be blowing out of the west or the north, and I'll be sitting on my patio, which is protected by the west and the north. And there's still gusts that that approach me from the south or the east. And it's like, well, how did that happen? What are you what are you bouncing off of? Yeah. What, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know. But it's it's a swirling kind of well, and it's the same thing about the the light that John talks a lot about I mean, starting out with on the very first chapter. It because light can penetrate darkness many times, seep in through cracks. And, and that light is always there, just like Jesus is always there for us. So that's you know, like the wind too. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it can blow dust into a house and you figure out how did that mm -hmm. everything sealed that how does that how does that light get in? How does that wind get in? But or how do you how do you how does a sailor use wind? To his advantage, even though he wants to go this way, but the wind is coming from that coming direction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for tack. To tack. Yeah. And, and how do you? Uh, I don't know. Some... I think that this book, to me, separates the trying of God into different things that we think about. God, the creator, you know, spent. So much time talking about God's creation, and then we got four or five gospels talking about Jesus and what He did for us, and basically Pentecost. Oh, and then He gave us the Holy Spirit. But it's all one powerful God who helps us and many different ways and it, I think that's why sometimes it's so hard for people to understand the Trinity and is because this book kind of separates them instead of talk so much about it and all it comes you, you have to figure that out for yourself I mean you have to bring that together mm -hmm. Well, good discussion this morning. Oh, is Don, is Don Lieberman okay? Uh, hmm. I, sorry. Not supposed to talk about it. Uh, Say the Lord's prayer before we. Yeah. Oh, our Father. Uh, our Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespassing, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.